If you're a residential real estate agent earning $200,000 a year and you want to grow your passive income, this show's for you. Learn the secrets other agents use and hear from experts in our field in order to guide you along your journey to investing in assets like apartment communities so that you can turn your commissions into cash flow. I'm Randall DeCleared. Let's go, baby. All right. Welcome back. It's great to have you today. I am Randall McCleared, your host. This is Agents Building Cashflow. Let's dive in. Today, we are talking to Trevor Thompson, a phenomenal guest, uh, hearing some of his background and how he got started into real estate. So I'm a big adrenaline junkie. I like jumping out of planes. I like going fast. I like, I like, I like a lot of those things. And so Trevor is background is in iFly. If you don't know what iFly is, check it out. We just got one in San Antonio, maybe a year or two, two years ago. And it's an indoor skydiving place where you can jump in to the, to this wind tunnel essentially and float and fly. So really cool to talk to him about that because he was there early days when they started. Um, he is, his background is, uh, also in, uh, like a haunted house he said he had down in Florida. And that's how he found the guys at, at, um, at the iFly place. So, he, he took the lessons he learned from that and he started buying apartment communities and he knew how to buy a business. He knew how to develop the land, knew how to do all these things. And so it's really interesting to see how he took those lessons and rolled it into his apartment uh, buying business. So yeah, it's really interesting to talk to him about the transition um, from the iFly into and, and some of the lessons that he learned into the multifamily space. And so um, he is on some assets here in San Antonio. He's got some in South Carolina, so he's got a lot of experience and uh, it's it's really good to have him on the show so you can learn something from him. So without further ado, let's bring on Trevor. Trevor, awesome to have you on the show. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Appreciate excited to be on. here. All right. So I was digging in. I looked at your background and your bio. There's a bunch of questions that I want to ask you about, you know, like the iFly stuff and all of that stuff. But before we get into that, I want to know really how you went from working kind of full time in your gig. Again, you can clarify this for me if yeah. I'm wrong, but it seemed like you were working full time and then you started investing in syndications or yeah. into a fund of some sort. So can you explain that process to somebody who's never really done that and yeah. and how that worked for you? Yeah. So, you know, I was always interested in real estate, but never quite figured out what to do. Right. You know, I thought, oh, could I be a real estate agent? Could I be this? But sort of never got there. And then years ago, in my, one of the first team meetings, actually, with iFly, which was my last full time career job, um, they gave us a copy of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which started a lot of people. Wow. And I did the unfortunate thing, put it back on the shelf. Just kept working my job, building my career, building my everything to do with my career. And it was always in the background. And I knew there were lots of reasons why you should get into real estate. And I'll be honest, I, I really wanted to do it, but afraid of toilets, tennis and trash, not, you know, no time, no money. And then I fly actually got bought out and I got killed on income tax. And I went, this is a pivotal moment in my life. I am never going to be in this position again where something like this can can you know be such a big alteration. I know there's power in real estate investing. Let me start looking. When I did the go the weekend seminars, basically give us fifty thousand on a credit card and we'll show you how to buy an office building with no money down. And uh, it didn't quite sound right. And I just kept shopping around and basically came across multifamily apartment syndications. And I went, I can. And to be honest, a big light bulb came on. This is a business. I'm actually investing in a business, not necessarily in anything else. And that, to me, that was the big aha moment. And, you know, since then, I've invested in 20 different syndications and gone to the active side with two more. Just tripped that switch. And I went, man, just eye opening that I could do that. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. So, so again, after you went to these seminars, how did you uh, get into your first syndication? Yeah, so I joined the local mentoring program, which I wouldn't recommend because they're mostly single family and it wasn't a route I wanted to go. Not that single family is bad. I just, to me, that was like buying a job, right? Yeah. Um, where investing in multi and then boom, I just started educating myself and then started quickly investing I'm basically that was back in 2018 and I signed up in October and by, you know, the end of the year, I'd already invested passively in two syndications. Um, and then I just kept researching more and more and expanding who I knew in the space and my own personal education within the space and just kept 
you know, had most of my money at that time in the stock market and just kept pulling it out, moving it along and putting it into real estate. So how did you find the first operator or uh, first syndication? So they were, they were part of my mentoring program. So Got it. Were, okay. They were sponsored through my mentoring program. Got it. Okay. So and that's so, a great way for people to start, right? Connecting in with mentoring groups. They all have their good and bad. I'm not going to recommend one of, but what you do is at least you start to connect with people. And to be honest, I'm still connected with this guy five years later. And now we're partnering on something else together on the active side. It's kind of a circle of life. There but, you go. Uh, you know, you really want to take the time to, to research who, and once you figure out the who, you just got to pull the trigger. Yeah. And so you got into these deals and they were, uh, I mean, that was a good time to start getting into apartments. It was, yeah. 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 So, yeah, when you, I guess, first got in and you didn't really have to vet them, I guess, you were buying into their experience because you got into the mentorship that's, program. That's correct. Like, okay. Yeah. I got a and since that, I've learned some things. Um, and have switched to investing with some different people, you know, some some things that my first two investments actually were challenging, ended up just getting my capital back, which is not very normal. But they they had a run of some good and then they just made some pretty decent mistakes on a couple of deals in a row and made them a real struggle. Can you, know, you that, that I happened. guess yeah, can you speak to that a little bit more just to to Yeah, to be honest, me? one of the big things they did was they overestimated what they could up the rents to yeah. on the property. They underestimated the, how aggressive Texas was going to get for property taxes and, in, and then underestimated insurance, you know, Katrina and then Snowgeddon. A lot of people don't know that Snowgeddon was a bigger insurance claim than Katrina. Really baffling, right? When you think of this, but because of the widespread, so much yeah. Texas debt and a lot of, you know, claim, but so they just underestimated those things and then they just could never get the property pulled around. It was a very deep value add and those properties did get hurt on COVID uh, more than other properties did. And, you know, we did get out with our money back and nobody lost any money. But uh, since yeah. then, I've, on the opposite side, I've had some huge winners. Yeah. So it's a business and so you're going to get your winners, your losers. And the, most of them are right in the middle or where you think they're going to be. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely one thing that's drawn me to the multifamily and just commercial real estate in general. It's, it's a, yeah. it is a business. Like you can actually look at the numbers and you're buying a stream of, of cash flows and, that's and that's exactly the, it. that's the whole deal. So a uh, much different ball game than the single family or you well, know, yeah, and setting a up a much job. bigger power of leverage too. So yeah. single family space, it's the value of your property is only the same as a neighborhood, but you can expansion, you know, get your value of your property is based on your income on the multifamily. So yeah. you can still have a fairly distressed income, really build up the net operating profit and get a big multiple on your money. And it just supercharges the leverage, right? Yeah. All right. All right. So let's jump back because I really want to talk about iFly yeah. a little bit. I know it's not germane to real oh, estate on, on the top level, but just to get to know you because I'm an extreme sports junkie. I enjoy doing things like jumping out of planes and bungee jumping and all that good stuff. So anyway, when I saw it on your on your profile, I was really curious. One, it, it seemed like if you were there from 2000, then that has been, you were there when it started. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah. so what happened was, is I'm originally from Niagara Falls, hence my Niagara Investments Company yep. name. And I moved to Orlando, oddly enough, and opened a year-round haunted house of all things. All right. Across the street, this strange thing, it was called Sky Venture at the time. It switched to, to iFly Open across the street. I didn't know much about it and I got recruited by a headhunter. So we had it and he also had another business called Suck Guy Coaster where they put you in a hang gliding harness, hoist you. And this one was the world's tallest, 300 feet in the air. And you pulled your ripcord and you, you swung about 180 feet the other direction. You could hit 70 miles. It was an amazing attraction. Yeah. But they didn't quite figure out how to market the iFly into skydiving. You know, they, they tried to make it a little too scary and survive in tourism or in the general world. You've got to be exciting, but still available for mom, dad, and the kids kind of deal. Yeah. And that was my specialty, right? You know, I've been in the attractions business since age 13. And, you know, when I first started, um, they were losing $50,000 a month. By the third month, we made $100,000 profit because they had a fixed cost. And once you could bring the revenue up, and then that was with the original owner. And then he took on a partner. And we started growing slowly. And then we just imploded. And eventually got bought out by a private equity company. 
which was good for me because I got a payday, bad for the company because they actually screwed it up, what a lot of private equity companies do. And then they, um, one of the original middle investors actually bought it back out um, from banks. Oh, wow. But, okay. But an interesting- Yeah, in and out. Yeah, but it went big. Like, you know, so again, when I started, we had one location. And then by the time I'd left, there were 80 locations. And my role had transitioned to opening new ones. So I actually opened 46 of 80 locations. And what that meant was I took it from construction, got it completely operational, up and running, and then basically gave it over to the operations department. So ordering all the furniture, training all the yeah. teams. Um, yeah, we went from when I originally started, there were 16 team members. And at the height, there were a thousand worldwide. Um, pretty, pretty big expansion for sure. Yeah, for sure. And, and it was a wild ride. I mean, I loved it. And the, the people that worked there were super passionate. About it. If, if you've ever been to an iFly, the team are just super passionate. We really coined delivering the dream of flight. Because if you think about it, everybody does dream of it, right? But this is crazy safest way to, to realize being able to fly. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible. Now there's one here in San Antonio and I didn't know it existed that long ago. Now it makes more sense that they iterated the, and changed the name a few times, but yeah, it, it, it's a really cool place. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Uh, and they got a little, you know, they made some mistakes, you know, they opened up in smaller markets. You, you kind of to spend that kind of money. It's a 10, $12 million investment. A lot of people don't realize it's that big of an investment. And so you, you need to do some serious income. But the beauty of it is it's a fairly fixed cost operation. And once you reach this tipping point, it's really only electricity after that point. And so it was very, very profitable at the moment we sold it to the private equity. Then they started making it a little too top heavy. Yeah. And then so, yeah, they went back and forth. So I guess starting out as a as a startup yeah. What are some lessons you took away from that uh, that apply to real estate in general? Because it seems you're doing the same. You're you're going and yeah, developing. Yeah, exactly a piece the of same. Code. And it was quite interesting. So many things are familiar. So we took over franchise locations that were struggling, and it's the same thing. You know, so basically we went in, we applied what I'm going to call sound business practices in all of our systems. So we would go in, often switch out some of the senior management, some of the team. We would put a little capex into the business, making it do, put in systems, add a little bit of marketing. And I mean, almost every time we would double double the earnings within a three-year period, which is exactly the same as multifamily. Yeah. And it's a, it's a different, this is an experience, but I also think like my goal for multifamily is that people think that I'm coming home, come over to my home, not to my apartment. And a lot of that is customer service. How do you make your residents feel valued? You know, I learned all that from my customer facing attractions business, right? You make people feel valued. And if you give people a good experience, they're more than happy to give you money for, for those things. You know, so in multifamily, it's making a better apartment, fixing things that are broken, making it safer, making it nicer, programs, events. It's oddly very similar. What a, so, so yeah, when you take, take over an apartment, I guess, what are some of the main things that you are putting in, in place now that are customer focused? That, that yeah. Are, so again, making sure that that our touch points with our residents, there's a lot of negativity in apartment complexes, right? Like they never fix anything. They never do this, yeah. they never do that. And it doesn't take a lot to get those things sorted out to where you do it, right? You'll not always make everybody happy, but you know, you deserve your plumbing to work, your AC to work, your heat to work. You know, you deserve some sort of quick response time. You deserve people that answer your questions and try to prove the quality of a property. And those are all the things that we do. We go in there and, and take more of a service mentality that we're here to make this place a better place. Now, in exchange for that, we do normally increase the rents. Some people cannot afford the new rents, so there is some displacement. But the people that aren't displaced, they're just so happy to have like a like I just took over a property in San Antonio a while ago and we've got residents coming in and I don't ever talk to residents. I let the team on site do it, you know, and, and you can just hear them saying, oh, I'm so glad somebody's here. And I got my, I actually like can use my dishwasher now. I mean, that's yeah. six, six weeks, this person's dishwasher. And it was just one simple part. Yeah. 
Yeah. Makes a difference for sure. And, and then they'll take care of the place better yeah. than, yeah, That's better great. tenants. So you know, I guess going back on the, on the iFly, cause, cause the ramp up was so dramatic again, working in a company where you are, where, how many were there when you first started? 12, you said? Well, there was 16 at the first location. Yes. And okay. That was the total team. Okay. Yeah. And then, and so, so did you have uh, people under you? Like, what was it like on the ramp up and how did your, I guess I'm curious from a startup to like a scaled uh, business. Yeah, like how so that, how that looked. it was very slow at the beginning, right? So we replaced some of the senior management. We got a better teams in place. We started building a better structure. It was about three years before we um, even sold some other locations. And even then we weren't quite, it was by the time we got to about 11 company owned locations that we really kind of had what I'm going to call a business model down pat. You know, we, we really knew what we were doing. We knew how to scale. We knew how to drive things. And, and then from there, it just started, you know, building on top of each other very, very quickly. Got it. So it was a franchise model and then you would be, you were like so the head we of were, development. So out of the 80 locations, two thirds were company owned, one third okay. were franchises, but not even true franchises. So for example, there's one at Yuma Proving Ground, U.S. military. Uh, Brazil has one, Spain has one, Qatar has one, Egypt has one, Abu Dhabi has one, and they actually use it for military paratroop training. So some of those are, were different business models. Um, we're on Royal Caribbean cruise lines. I remember launching the first one. It was super exciting, but that was a different business model again on an all inclusive cruise ship where, you know, they had to figure out how to make that model work. Yeah. And so it was a slightly different model than our normal one. So it took a little while. So I actually, it was really tough. I had to go on a cruise ship, all of the yeah. sports team around. Terrible. And it actually was because I got terrible seasickness. <laughs> I don't think I ate the whole five days I was there. But it was, you know, but just figuring out how does this fit into their current business model, which was quite a bit different type of an attraction for them. But they, they're they used to trying kind of exotic things and pretty well-developed company and, uh, and I think we're on four now. Yeah. man, that's, that's fantastic though. I think just in general, I always like startups and the story of startups and how they, yeah. they ramp up and what they do. And so being able to speak to you about that is interesting. And yeah. And, and at the beginning, you know, we, we always referred that we were building the race car in the middle of the race. Um, yeah. is how we always referred to ourselves. And at the beginning, starting up, we sort of reached a point where there was 12 of us. And we used to say 12 people doing 100 people's work. It was kind yeah. of a badge of honor within. And then oddly enough, the private equity company did grow it to 100 people and just made it way top heavy, way, way unresponsive. You know, um, one thing the original owner was always afraid of was fat and lazy. And that's what happens sometimes with companies. Yeah. Again, it's, it's interesting to see it ramp up. And I think it speaks to your experience on that front as well. Just seeing how that whole thing ramps up and you can look at a bunch of different things. When you're in a startup, you get to see, you get to wear all the hats. Yeah. <laughs> you get to do all those other hundred jobs. So yeah, it gives yeah. you a, a, a wealth of experience and knowledge. Um, okay. So yeah, let's go into like right now we are in an inflationary environment, right? The market, the debt market is chaotic i would say or or uh, rates are rising right yeah so how are you handling communications with your limited partners and what are you seeing well, we'll just do one question at a time yeah, like, so so on my deals that i'm on the active side we managed to do a loan assumptions one was a loan assumption one was the seller financed at a fixed rate so when we did them, you know, it was 5.1% and we, you know, this was several months ago, it took a while to close the deal and we were like right on the edge. And of course now we're geniuses, right? Cause it would have been eight or not, you know, plus percent or whatever. So most of what I'm looking at right now are properties that have fixed debt with an assumable loan um, and trying to see if you can make the numbers work to buy it with fixed rate debt. Because it's really hard to buy it with fresh debt right now. You know? yeah. It's very hard to get. The loan to value is very low. There's just a lot of things. Don't get me wrong. People are still doing it, but it's much more challenging. And especially, you know, I'm smaller, further down the food chain, as I call it. So, you know, we have to look for those deals that are you know, what I'm going to call the low hanging fruit. There's this debt. We can assume it. You've lost your interest only period, which is really good thing to get. But we just can't get it right now, right? Because we just, it's hard to do it. 
And as a passive investor, I have a couple of deals that I'm passively in and they've suspended dividends just because their rate caps have expired and uh, it's eating up their cash flow. And even though they're still on interest only, it's really eating up their cash flow. So, so if you're new getting this space and maybe you have an opportunity, I have an opportunity, right? We, we're going out, we're talking to our capital partners and saying, Hey, you want to put some money into this deal? Yeah. Um, what is that conversation like on your end? What are you seeing in the market right now? Yeah. So, so again, it's, it's very, very deal specific, right? With the thing that you need to do when you're trying to raise money or connect with people, you need to get them to trust that you understand what's happening and that you're going to present to them what I'm going to refer to as a quality, well thought out deal, right? Um, based on the current conditions. Now we're, we're far from normal right now. And the problem is we, we are coming out of far from normal. Okay. Normal is interest rates four, five, six percent, right? That's normal. I'm an old guy. That's normal when you look back at the history of the world. You know, these two, three, four percent interest rates were abnormal. Then all of a sudden now you skyrocket to abnormal six, seven, eight percent interest. Somewhere in the middle is kind of normal. And, and so you just got to be careful what you're looking at and can, can you make the numbers work at those Interest rates. I mean, you know, whether you get a summable loan and now you're, you, you miss the interest only period or you have an interest only period, but you have a hope within three years once the IO is burned off that the world will be back to more normal. Um, yeah. I, which, IO, if you don't know what it means, it's interest only, but yeah. Yeah. Interest only. And that's the, one of the big multipliers in multifamily, right? The fact that you can, blows my mind when I figured it out that you can get non recourse debt interest only payments i mean it's the it's the gasoline on the fire right it's what really accelerates these deals and and makes them so spectacular yeah so you've got uh, again i guess getting back to i'm i'm curious on on just the limited partners and the capital raising right now cuz last year year before everyone's getting money everyone is getting flush everybody has excess capital to invest there's a lot of money sloshing around and now you know, I don't know the last time you put an opportunity out. It sounds like the last six months or so you put one no, out. No, it so. was brutal. So just just to give you an idea, you know, I put a deal out this summer and we were just starting to get a little, and that was one with fixed that, that rate, you know, and it, and it was, I don't say it was a breeze for me, but I raised a half a billion dollars and comfortably. And I went to do another deal. And even though they had already, they, they'd gone into the deal saying, this is our interest rate and all of these different things. I couldn't raise one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Just everybody was in a like kind of scared mode, and that you know, that's what I want to hit hit on. It just kind of like what were the conversations like from that deal to the one that you had had yeah, more so trouble. The, the biggest difference was, you know, uh, I'm going to hold on and wait and see. I think that was the biggest question, right? And I kept trying to tell them that's okay. Hold on and wait and see. You know, clearly I'm not going to force you to make an investment, and it turns out to be bad. But what people don't realize is hold on and wait and see your money in this high inflationary period is rapidly declining in value. It's like you're losing money, holding money. And that was part of the conversation, but you still couldn't get them past the fear. It was really, you know, they just, that that's the logical way to look at it. That's the way I look at it. And, um, you know, so I've invested in three deals in this last quarter passively personally. And because I don't want my money sitting there depreciating in value. Yeah. And as a professional real estate person, the, the cost segregation and the bonus depreciation and all of those things is an accelerant uh, for me to not pay taxes. So it, it's, it's a little bit easier to make those investments because at least I'm saving something and risking how much will I earn. And you know, you got to remember most deals are three to seven years, right? Three is very rarely is something less than three years. And very rarely is it more than seven on the type of syndications we look at. And I think we'll return to normalcy. And I'm not an economist. You know, I listen to a lot of stuff, but, you know, I'm assuming it's going to be 24. We'll start to, you know, start to roll back a little. I think this year is going to be a tough year. 24. Oh, yeah. In 2024. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. the same. same I mean, I'm thing. hoping they I'm come same. down Q3 23. You know, a lot of people are saying that they're going to come down a little bit. You know, we still have, we yeah. have hikes coming. I mean, we have more. 
they, they've talked about um, how we're going to see hikes through the majority of the year uh, from, yeah. from what I last heard. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that's kind of what I was driving at. Like those conversations are very, they, they sound familiar, I'm afraid, or uh, who knows what's going to happen in the real estate market or whatever the concern is. Um, but it is hard to conceptualize losing money on an inflation rate when it, your dollar stays the same in your bank account, but it's really not yeah. the same. <laughs> your yeah. spending power has gone down, whether you see it or not. Um, and so getting over that when you're not either in investments all the time or in finance all the time. So, yeah. Um, and I do believe the silver lining in all this, there will be some distressed deals. Correct. Coming near the end of this year. Um, you know, I'm on a couple of deals as a passive investor and they've already suspended payments and nobody wants to hear that. And two of them now have done a cash call, not a big one, but get us over the hump one. And no investor wants to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was interesting when the the rates jumped up and bridge debt is on so bridge debt if you don't know it's it's kind of like a, a short term loan so you can refinance or uh, rehab the property and then refinance in a permanent debt permanent debt or sell the property within 3 to 5 years something like that um it's tied to a floating rate and so when when the rates increase a lot of people had rate caps which would cap your interest rate at two points or something above what you or above what sofer is and so a lot of people have been paying these higher interest rates but not as high as the actual rate yeah. Um, and so when those expire or if they expire, then the operators experience a, a massive increase in the monthly payments yeah. <laughs> that are due. And so it makes it challenging to cash flow a property if that was not in the underwrite. Yeah. Um, so I kind of want to get into that side of it. Like you got into like to the 2018, right? You said you started yeah. getting into, okay. So obviously that was a great time to get in. And then you would have seen properties through COVID. Yeah. And so, you know, what were some of the challenges that you faced either in your deals? I don't know if you had any active deals or if you're still just passive at that point. But yeah, how did how did, I mean you can't underwrite for COVID? No one could. So nobody could underwrite for COVID. And it it a lot depended on where you were and what assistance programs were in place and your tenant base, right? So if you're, if you are in a deep value add lower class property, telling somebody who's already at the fringe of life that it's going to ruin their credit rating if they don't pay you is of minimal consequence because they were a hostess at Applebee's and Applebee's shut down and I got no money coming in. Then of course, if you were in an area, so I had a property in San Antonio at the time and they were pretty proactive on rent relief. And as long as you dotted your I's and crossed your T's and helped some of the tenants fill the paperwork out, because we had some seniors that didn't know how or whatever, you could get the rent relief and it and it kept coming, kept the money coming in. And then of course, coming out of COVID, all of a sudden now you've got rampant rate, rental rate increases, you know, went at exceptionally high. And that kind of started to cause a little bit of a different problem again. People in A-class properties no longer could afford it, moved to B's, and B's no longer could afford it, maybe moved to a C. And if you were a C, you just had higher delinquencies. Yeah. So what are you seeing uh, going forward then? Yeah, because that is something that I see as a challenge going forward. We're not, we're not going to get the double-digit rent, rent increases, yeah. right? If anything, I, I think rents are going to have to come down a bit because there's going to be, one, the affordability problem, but if we, if people start losing jobs at a, at a wider scale and they can't afford to, to live in that class A property, you know, what is the, what, what's the deal that you're looking for? What's your bread and butter that you're looking for? Going so for? again, I'm very lucky that I live in one of the best States in the world. Right. So you want to look, I mean, jobs are still coming to Texas. Yeah. Uh, thank God. Right. Jobs are still coming to Texas. I'm glad I'm not in a state where everybody's fleeing. So I feel some areas will be very insulated from this. It will definitely have some effect, but not a massive effect, right? Because because there's just so many fresh bodies coming in and some of those bodies are coming from very expensive places, California, New York or whatever. So even, oh, we think it's high here, they think it's low here still, right? They're still, they're still getting good value for their money. So states like Arizona, Texas, the Carolinas and Florida, 
we're pretty ins- and that's where all my investing is because I look even now with this pressure, you still want to look for growth areas, growth communities, growth areas, new jobs coming because that's what's going to save you, right? If you're in a spot where there are no new jobs coming and you know, people, it, you're not going to be able to get your rents, right? Because no new jobs are coming. If I lost my job and no new ones coming, now I got to move to a new community or do something. So that's why it's very important to be in in good good places. Yeah, Texas, go Texas, baby. Let's do yeah, it. Yeah, I know. I love Texas. <laughs> I'm glad we're here. I'm glad we're here. That's right. So, you know, what, what are you excited about in multifamily then? Like right now, today, are you, are you, uh, putting letters in 10 out? Are you seeing anything that's penciling? Like what's going on? Yeah. So we're, we're definitely still looking for deals more on the loan assumption, like I mentioned. So they're harder and harder to find. And I'm hoping that the balance between, so sellers still haven't come down and realized what's happening in the world. And, um, buyers were overpaying because, you know, this, this, all this growth just could, could carry over bad business decisions. So I'm hoping, I'm really hopeful that this year they'll, will balance out a little bit, right? So, uh, just, just for example, there was a deal that I kept losing deals, right? And there was a deal, the whisper price, which is code name for asking, even though they never do, was nine and a half million. And I thought, okay, I've lost every deal I've gone after. This is a great property. I'm going to start at 10. Foolish, right? Start at 10. 1% hard day one, which means I'm going to lose $100,000 if I don't close. Another 1% hard in 15 days, which means I better look at that property quickly. Or I'm going to lose another $100,000. Somebody paid $11 million. When? Where was this? It was in Temple. And this oh. was right at the height of the craziness, right? Okay. Yeah. And, you know, I went from 10, 10, 250, 10, 3, 10, 4. I gave up like 10, 4. I was like, and I'm hoping that same deal will come up for sale this year. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know? And I can, I can buy it for 10 again, yeah. you know? You know, so so some of that craziness, you know, just because everybody would and and a lot of money. So I'm hoping that this year is the year, to be honest, I'm going to call it the year that things balance out and go. So, yes, the interest rates are higher, but you're going to get a property at a better price. Yeah, that's I'm hopeful for that as well. Um, I I mentioned it in another call. It just seemed like reality and fundamentals went out the window and everybody was hoping, not hoping, but underwriting for double digit rent growth year over year charging for everything and and it doesn't matter we're always going to get this so um i have not seen sellers in general on mass come down on their pricing there are some deals obviously that they're they're feeling the pinch and um uh, i think brokers are are trying to get things to move but if you gave a bov which is broker penny to value in the last 6 months or you had a property listed for 6 months and that was your bov it doesn't look good for them to come back to their client and say, Hey, by the way, (laughs) you need to take 40% off of this price because you missed the boat. I know I'm at, I'm going to call myself, I'm at the bottom of the food chain, right? I'm a small guy. Right. And when I have brokers calling me saying, just put in an offer, um, you know, and again, I'm not looking at big deals. I'm looking at the size appropriate, but you know, it's never been that way. Like it's yeah. like I couldn't even get them to return my call. And even on some other deals, like I said, hey, listen, my offer is going to be around this range. And they're like, do me a favor, don't even send it in. Now they're like saying, at least send it in. Yeah. Um, so there's definitely some change in the market. And yeah. and I'm just hoping that things will get to you'll be able to offer for a property what it's really worth. I yeah. Guess yeah, saying. for not sure. What, not what the current value, not the future value. Everybody was selling for the future. Hundred percent. Yeah, I likened it to like selling a piece of paper that you could possibly one day get a famous artist to write or draw on. <laughs> it's like, I promise you, that's what it's going to be worth. You just give me half of that, and then and, and we'll call it a deal. I'm like, no, it's a piece of paper. What are you talking about? <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm in those in the same boat. So, uh, yeah, again, I'm still kind of curious. So you've got these deals. How many active? What are, what are you on, on the GP side? Like, how many doors are you at? Oh, so on the GP side, I'm only like uh, 140. 140. So 75 in San Antonio. And I'm look what I'm going to call. I'm a co-GP, like I'm a full-time. And then I'm 65 doors in Columbia, South Carolina. I'm like a teeny part of somebody else's deal. 
Okay. So even even on those though, you're you're more on the active side where you're you're like on the asset management side per se. Yeah, so right? on, on the South Carolina one, basically I just do tasks like you know, rent comps and built different different things for people that are what I'm gonna call the lead asset managers and the investor relations with my investor, where the other one I'm the full asset manager. So right actually at the beginning, you know, for the first quarter, I'm actually going to the property once a week. Um, and then the goal is twice a month, once a month, once a quarter as we stabilize. So, and and that's just because I'm trying to build my own skill set up. So I want to touch it, feel it, see it, do it. Because yeah, I think for sure. I'm learning faster that way. Yeah, hundred percent. So, are you seeing any specific um, challenges or any any thing you're again you're excited about when you're on seeing that side of the deal? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm definitely. I mean, again, for us, we thought we'd have more tenant turnover and to our surprise, we've got some great tenants. They just want somebody to take care of them, somebody to help them out, somebody to take care of the property. So super, super surprised of that. I'm in workforce housing and they're just hardworking, good people that want a nice place to live, right? And when you start to provide that to them, there's a big reward in that, right? You know, they're, just, they're, they're hardworking people that just want a nice place to live. You know, home ownership is completely out of the realm of their capabilities, and but they just want a nice place to live that's with that's within their budget. Yeah. Uh, so, I guess, what advice would you give to uh, uh, again uh, a limited partner you're talking to right now, and in, in this in this time frame, you know, keep your eyes open, keep your ears open. Yeah. So Those just deals. you know, obviously. The, my advice is always the same, right? Um, whether because my advice is find somebody you know, like and trust, and then and that has some somewhat of a track record, spends a lot of energy explaining what's happening, and is putting their own money in that deal as well, right? Again, there were lots of people starting out that weren't putting money in their own deals and just getting acquisition fees and asset management fees, and you know, look for those red flags, right? Look for people. Um, you know, you want people that are truly invested in their their own properties. And regardless of the time, again, I looked for 18 months to get on one deal. <laughs> so I'm super cautious to get there. And that gives me a little traction. Now I've closed one more. People are reaching out to me. Hey, I heard you close this. I've got a property, you know, 20 minutes away from you. Are you interested in looking at it? Yeah. Um, so that for me has been good news. Yeah, for but sure. If you're investing with people that that know what they're doing, I think this is this year is going to separate the adults and the you know you you could make money just about any way the last three years, right? It was you had to work really hard not to make money. Now you're going to have to work really hard to make money. Yeah, yeah. When I started buying, um, I started buying in a down market. So I got back from Australia in 2008 or nine. And I mean, obviously the market had just tanked. It was um, an interesting time to be getting into real estate. I was trying to buy when I was in Australia, but it was it was difficult. And so when I got back, I was lucky to be buying into that market. And so yeah, you know, kind of like now I feel like, okay, we're kind of getting to a dip. Not yeah. yet, but we're getting to a dip because we were on we're such a, a tear for such a long time. And so the opportunities should present themselves. Um, just be patient and obviously makes something that makes sense. Again, yeah. when we're underwriting deals and I'm looking at everything, it's it's a, what is it making today, right? Like what is that deal actually kicking off today? Not not what could be or what potentially could happen in the future. And so I think that shift mentally, that's how I've always, always invested. Yeah. You know, it always just, and that's why it was hard for me to make sense of, of some of the deals when I first started looking at them. I was like, wait, what? This thing's, what? <laughs> What's happening here? Um, so. But but yeah, there's definitely opportunity coming up. And so I'm looking forward to that. Um, well, Trevor, it's been awesome having you on. I want to uh, just wrap it up and just ask some non-real estate related question. Sure. Um, you know, what is your favorite pastime not related to business? Wow. That's pretty sad that I don't really have one. Hey, my man, <laughs> let's I do really some business. <laughs> I really don't have one, you know. I mean, I guess... But it, it is related to business. I, I, I'm an avid learner. So Audible books have just like, once I found Audible, car is my university now, right? Yeah. I, I just, I'm listening and I try to listen to a real estate book, a business book, 
And then what I'm going to call something interesting that could be like the Andre Agassi stories, one other thing, nothing to do with business, but yeah. an amazing, amazing journey through yeah. this, like how he almost sabotaged himself because he oddly enough hated tennis, very bizarre. And then until he didn't compete, then now he loves tennis because he's found a reason for his charity work that he does tennis. It's it's quite a, a amazing human story. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. So since you brought that up, what are, I know you mentioned a book before we even got started, but what, since you listened a lot, what is your one or two top picks for books you would recommend? Yeah. So if you're just looking to get yourself motivated and get going and you got to do it in audible, you got to listen to 10 X, then you got to listen to be obsessed or be average, do them in that order. Cause it be obsessed or be average is kind of a follow up and you got to do them in audible, love them or hate them. Grant Cardone, man, he can, he does a really good job presenting it. If you're looking to learn about passive investing, um, James Kamasami has a great book called Passive Investing. If you're looking to get into syndication, Joe Fairless has a book called The Best Ever Syndication Book. And it's just, he basically just outlines it from A to Z, just in methodical order. You know, it's it's not like a colorful read, but it's, uh, this is from A, this is how you get a deal done from here to there. Yep. Yep. I've seen those. Awesome. Okay. So those are some great picks. We'll throw them in the show notes so that people can get to them. All right. So then what is the best thing or memory that's happened to you, your family in the last 60-ish days? Recent history. Recent history. I think went up to Canada where I'm originally from and my daughter had an engagement party getting married. And it was as a dad, you know, the, the, you know, my sister, my daughter said I wasn't allowed to give a speech. And I said, and then I stood up and said, I don't care. I'm going to give a speech. A speech. <laughs> That's right. And I said, all that any dad wants is to see his daughter happy and be taking care of somebody. And I think I've, she's found it. Yeah. And to me, that was just like. Well, um, congrats. Yeah. yeah. And so it was just, you know, to be able to say that was super cool. Yeah. Very cool. Well, congrats again on that. And then uh, finally, let's see, name one or two people who have been most influential in the way you think or to your success. Yeah, so definitely on the multifamily side, James Kamasami, whose book I mentioned, I'm also part of his mentoring program. You know, he's a great giver and a communicator. But I would say the, the, the second owner of iFly was the most inspiring person to me. He had this philosophy, if you're not making any mistakes, you're just not taking enough chances in life to get anywhere. Yeah. And you know, it, he Love was it. just like, you could screw something up big time. And it did not matter as long as we learned. Yeah. And, you know, how, how would we learn from it? And it was just super powerful. It just, it was, I, it just blew me away that, yeah. that he had that, that just that desire to, you, you don't want to look for people with good answers. You want to look for people with good questions. He had, he was the guy with the good questions. Why, why did this not work? What did we do? What they did? did, did. Mm -hmm. And just this methodical dissection of the, uh, almost something that would be disastrous in anyone else's life. He took joy in figuring out how we could not do it again. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. We had a, a coach, football coach, and he was kind of in the same vein. He's like, I don't care if you make mistakes, but you got to be going full speed when you make that mistake. And then obviously he'd watch video and do all the same breakdown that he would do. But uh, very helpful when you're, when you're flying around <laughs> making, making those mistakes and iterating quickly. Um, so yeah, again, man, had a good chat, good catching up with you, get to know more about how you got into real great. estate and I got started. It. Appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us. Um, I'm going to have all your info down in the show notes so people can reach out to you and get to know you. If you have any opportunities or anything like that, then we will put those there as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Good catching up, Trevor. Have a good one. Take care. Thank you. All right. Bye. Did you know that 80% of the agents we speak with got into real estate in order to gain passive income so they could obtain financial freedom and become work optional? If you want to stay up to date, the best way is to make sure you're subscribed. So if you haven't done that, go ahead and do it now. We'll catch you on the next episode.